All right, let's now take a brief look under the hood of a recurrent neural network. So here we are going to talk about backpropagation through time. This is essentially the backpropagation algorithm we have seen earlier, except that we now take a look at how it might work if we have this time dimension. And also don't worry, I won't ask any detailed questions about that in the quiz because yeah, this is a complicated topic and here we are only really briefly looking at it. So you don't have to know the details here. It's just like to illustrate briefly that backpropagation also applies to recurrent neural networks. So here I'm showing you a figure that is uh, similar or looks similar to what I've shown you before in an earlier video. So here we have a recurrent neural network with a single hidden layer. On the left hand side, this is the compact notation where we only see um, the input and the output here. And then we have the hidden layer here with this recurrent edge. However, compared to before, what's different now is that I have added these weight matrices that we use here. So there are three weight matrices. Um, let's say one, two, and three. Let's, uh, well, let's enumerate it like this, one, two, and three. So what we can see here is that one matrix connects the input to the hidden layer, and then there's one weight matrix connecting the hidden layer to the output layer. Um, these are weight matrices that you would find, so one and two, they would, you would find them in a regular multilayer perceptron. However, now in the RNN, we have three. We have basically all the ones from the multilayer perceptron plus this weight matrix three here, which is the one from the previous hidden state. So or to summarize, in a RNN here, we have two matrices for the hidden layer. One is connecting the input here, so the input to the hidden layer, and the other one is connecting the previous hidden layer to the current hidden layer, which is this HH here. So on the right hand side is the unfolded version, and um, you can see so that we have Oh, you can see also that we are reusing these matrices. So at each time step, we use the same matrix here for the input connected to the hidden state. And then we also use the same matrices here for each um, time step. So the same matrix connecting the hidden state to the next hidden state. And then we also have these here. So what's really new compared to a multilayer perceptron is that we have these in green. So this is new and this is new. These are weight matrices that we did not have in the multilayer perceptron before. Um, so how do we compute now the hidden state? I mean, this is essentially very similar to computing the regular net input, except that we have now two yeah, uh, weight matrices and two inputs. So Let's consider this case where we compute the net input for this hidden state here at time step t. So what we do is we, like before, when we computed the net input in a multilayer perceptron, we multiply this weight matrix here with this input here, and that gives us the hidden state. We also may write this differently like this, right? So um, we talked about this before in the linear algebra lecture. I don't know why I've written this in a different order, but it's the same thing. Um, yeah, and then this is one input. The other one is HH from the previous hidden state, T minus one. So maybe to use different colors, this one is of course this one for, so this is a net input for this hidden layer. And then this part is computing this part and this part here is computing this part. And then we add also yeah, our bias here. So the bias is for this um, hidden state here. All right, so this is how it looks like, how we compute the net input. And then to compute the activation, we would just use an activation function like 10H or the sigmoid or ReLU function. And yeah, this is how we compute the net input. Now. Um, how do we compute the net input f 
for the output. This is exactly like what we do for multilayer perceptron. So we have one weight matrix here, um, the hidden state, and then the bias. And then again, we can use a activation function, for example, softmax activation or the sigmoid activation if we have a binary output or yeah or just a linear layer if it's a regression output and so forth so here this is really the same that we would do for multilayer perceptron now uh, what about the loss so yeah, it really depends on what type of task or sequence modeling task we talk about. So if you only want to predict one label for a given text, you technically don't need these losses here. You only need a loss, uh, a single loss from the last one here. Some people argue it might be uh, good though to keep the intermediate losses as well. It helps training the earlier layers. So I think, I mean, depending on who you ask, some people keep these losses, some don't. If you, when you compute, um, also a many to one sequencing problem. And uh, it is different though, if you have a many to many, then you want to have multiple losses. So let's take a look, a look at the, just a general case. So you can have different losses here, a loss for each time step. Um, and when you then want to compute the overall loss, you can yeah, just sum them up. So that would be the overall loss. Um, yeah, so this would be just looking at the loss. By the way, there's a paper on backpropagation through time, what it does and how to do it. So here we are really just briefly scratching the surface. So this might be some resource to consult. And also there are probably many different tutorials on the internet also for doing that in detail. For this class, given that we have several generative um, modeling topics still to discuss, um, here we are not going to spend too much time on these details. But yeah, so in order to highlight one of the issues that are apparent when we use spec propagation through time, let's just briefly focus on how the gradient of a particular loss at time step t is computed with respect to this um, WHH hidden matrix. So here, um, let's assume we have loss t at that layer here. So what will happen is that we do the back propagation Right, so we would compute the partial derivative or gradient of this loss at the time step with respect to y t, so with respect to this one. And then we would compute the gradient of y t with respect to h t, so with respect to that one. So here we covered this part. But then, yeah, so this is uh, essentially what we would do for a regular multilayer perceptron. But then on, on top of that, we have this term here, which um, is essentially the through time step where we have uh, time steps from K1 to T. So from up to the very beginning. So we have partial derivative or gradient of HT with respect to the one in the very beginning. So summing them up and those themselves, we won't go into too much detail here, but those themselves are a product here. And the product is essentially what could cause problems like vanishing or exploding gradient problems. So don't worry about the details here too much. So really the, I would say the main point here is not really doing this by hand because usually we have autograd implemented in PyTorch and stuff like that. So we would not have to implement these types of things by hand. But this highlights uh, the main issue that if we have a lot of uh, multiplications, we can have these vanishing or exploding gradient problems if we have very large or very small numbers that we multiply multiple times. So in the next video, I will talk about the so-called long short-term memory, which is one approach to, um, yeah, to mitigating this exploding or vanishing gradient problems.